In this episode of We as Citizens, I have Shane Smitty talking about his experiences in the cannabis industry while living in Canada. Things said in this episode are his experiences and not meant to be advice or to be substituted for knowing the laws where you live. This is an adult topic, so if you have some little ones around, grab your headphones now. This was a great conversation. Welcome to the We as Citizens podcast. Here is your host, Christina Crowley. Welcome to the podcast. Today I have with me Shane Smitty. He is coming to us from Ireland. Shane used to live in Canada for the previous three years. He worked in the cannabis industry during the legalization in Canada. Right now, he is back in Ireland. He has his own podcast we'll talk a little bit about, The High Cost of Living. Welcome, Shane. I'm glad to have you here today. Thank you for having me, Christina. I'm glad to be here. So tell me a little bit about yourself. So uh, I think you kind of covered most of the basics, you know, I'm Shane, I'm 27. I come from Cork, Ireland, born and raised. And um, yeah, I spent the last three years in Canada working in the cannabis industry, which was a very interesting experience. And uh, I've been home now since early January. So three months, pretty wow. much. And um yeah, there's no cannabis industry here in Ireland, so. <laughs> I can imagine. So did you move to uh, Canada particularly to work in the industry, or did it just happen once you got there? It kind of just happened when I got there, although we did used to kind of congregate with friends and talk about, you know, weed's legal in Canada. It's so cool. You know, they got dispensaries. and Because we go back and forth from to Amsterdam a lot here. Because it's like one hour on a flight and Amsterdam is famous for its coffee shops and whatnot. So, and w when we knew that the same setup was in Vancouver, we thought, wow. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your time there and what your experience was and where, what kind of a job you had in the industry. Okay, so I remember the exact date. I think it was the 17th of October, 2018. So just on the fourth quarter of the year, they legalized marijuana. And when I was there, I was working as what they call a bud tender. Like instead of a bartender, you have a bud tender. Pretty self-explanatory. You're just weighing up different quantities of weed and selling it by the weight. And I was working with some kind of OGs, if you like, in the industry. And they were like, you know, a lot of people here don't appreciate it but you're working in this industry in a really like historic time that will be spoken about for decades or if not centuries to come you know because weed's illegal and there's this huge shift now and it's legal overnight and you know he's just like remember this day <laughs> and i was like i will but um <laughs> The shop that I was working in at the time was the, the whole model was basically something that kind of took me by surprise was most of the owners were young guys, you know, and it didn't seem like it took much or you didn't need much experience in business to just rent out a premises and basically just start selling cannabis over the counter. And many of these stores in fact, most of these stores were unlicensed and weed hadn't been legal and they were open for years before legalization. And I was kind of thinking, how is this allowed? And they basically just kind of turn a blind eye to the whole thing. Uh, but there's stipulations now in place that, you know, you can't have a, dis have a dispensary within a certain, I think it's two kilometers of a school or a hospital and all these other stipulations. And it just, it kind of blew my mind at the time. So did Canada, do you know, did they take any of the lessons that were learned uh, by opening up legalization in the States? I know in the States, only the 15th state, which is New York state, has just legalized marijuana. I know Oregon was the first, Colorado where I live at was the second. I think it was the second or the third. Uh, and there have been some pretty hard lessons. Granted, I mean, you know, there's a lot of differences between Canada and the US, but uh, what kind, how did they model it? Well, 
it's yeah, it's tricky because they came in and it was basically like the stores I'm talking about were all black market per se. Okay. The weed was very affordable for people and now the government came in on that date October 17th 2018 and they regulated all of the weed and they set up what's known as the government stores where basically the government weed is like let's say 15 to 20 dollars per gram whereas usually it would have been five to ten you know Mm -hmm. and people are kind of outraged by it and still buying from the black market rather than buying from the legal stores because the quality in the legal stores isn't as good either and my store that I was working at at the time got shut down the very next day of legalization so we were all like woo weed's legal and then the next day we show up and it's like okay we're shutting down (laughs) government orders because the government was going to make good money off of it i assume basically yeah they they were it's kind of all comes down to greed i i'm not joking when i was in vancouver uh the first i was there for three years and the first year was like so many pot shops on every corner of vancouver all very cheap affordable and the quality was grade a stuff you know and then the second year it was it was hard to find a pot shop it came to that point every pot shop closed down and in my three years there i worked in seven or eight different cannabis dispensaries and my friends were like oh my god why can't you keep a job is there something (laughs) wrong with you and i'm like no it's not me like you know i'm not getting fired or anything these stores are literally just getting shut down and it's it was so disappointing every time I I got pretty frustrated. I was like, okay, I think I'm just done with this whole thing. Because maybe I misunderstood, and, and I in my research it was it was kind of hit and miss of finding what's really going on in Canada. So it's the government that it's okay to uh, sell the legalized cannabis, but independent shops couldn't. That's it. Yeah. Um. Oh. Basically. There, there's a lot of shops like the ones I was in yeah. were selling without a permit yeah. and then they would close down. And then they would, some shops I was in would go through this process of trying to obtain their, their license to sell and they just wouldn't get it. They'd go through this, like they're in the gray area for a few months and like it's mm-hmm. pending and then only to be told at the end of it all, sorry, you have to shut down immediately and we would get like written testimonies from our customers and everything to say we're providing an essential service to the community and all of that and they didn't care you know they just wanted us out so that they could come in and set up a a quote-unquote legal cannabis dispensary and get all the profits and you know they charge a whole lot more as well and the quality wasn't up to scratch either you know we reckon the the weed that they were selling was probably sitting on a shelf for months and not fresh. And like, if you're a weed smoker, you know, you, people that are listening, if you, if you have a bud that's like dried out, it's not very good quality. Like they want something fresh. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it totally does. And so did the government grow their own or did they take, you know, stuff that they may have, have seized from somewhere? Hmm. I think uh, the latter. Yeah, I think Uh they actually took because I was in it it actually happened in one dispensary I was at, but I wasn't working on the day. It was my day off and the cops came in. Thank God. (laughs) The cops came in and uh, raided the dispensary and they used to sell like the weed out of these cans, probably about the size of your forearm. And they took 20 to 30 of these cans and we're like, what do they actually do with that stuff? You know, it's like, surely they they sell it. They probably do sell it in the legal dispensaries. And they probably months later. And that's why it's all yeah. dried out, you know? Yeah. So, it, but saying that, sorry. I mean, like the illegal dispensaries are still operating. Like they all shut down for a time and then they started kind of coming back in. So there's, they're coexisting with the government stores. 
uh, illegal stores and legal stores. And it's just, it's pretty easy to differentiate which is which when you go in, you just kind of, you get a feeling, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So there's, so from the sign outside, uh, somebody like me, who, if I were up in Vancouver, would I be able to tell the difference between a government store and an illegal store? Yes, I would say the price is the biggest giveaway. Okay. You know, if if it's a good price, it's probably not legal. Okay. And if you're paying a premium, it's probably a government store. Yeah. And like the government stores have all these regulations in place too. Like, I can't even remember now off the top of my head, but I walked in there one day and, you know, you couldn't like you couldn't see or smell anything before you bought it you just had to like look at a picture of it or something and people want to you know see what they're buying of course and another thing that just comes to my head there like I know we just talked about price but you know a pre-roll like picture like a rolled up uh-huh. cigarette style joint and uh, uh-huh. they're like 15 dollars for one pre-roll <laughs> and in the illegal stores you'd get probably three joints for 15 at five five dollars each so it's they're kind of ripping people off in a way and i thought it's hardly a sustainable business model people are always just gonna go to the black market per se when it's cheaper and better quality but i i really to this day don't know or don't understand how like because the police know about these illegal stores the government knows about these illegal stores and they just allow them there for months at a time and then eventually they pull the trigger and shut it down you know but they they walk past every day or yeah. it's, it's I don't know how and it's been like that for years what I, I think a lot of happens down here in Colorado where I live there is no government store open here in the state so if anybody from the states is listening to this that seems to be the big a difference um, mm. that I see yeah. is that Uncle Sam has taken their part, <laughs> gives them no place to bank. So, what about banking up in Vancouver? What were the people in the boot? What what type of a store did you call a bootleg store? Yeah, uh, just basically an illegal yeah, dispensary. <laughs> how did they bank? Did they were they able to? Because I know here in Colorado there were some awful things going on because there was nowhere for these legal stores to put their profits to put their to put their money in a bank so yes that's a that's a good question and that's actually something i should have mentioned first thing first thing you know like most of the stores were cash only so they're tax free you know customers would come here because they know they're not paying tax and tax is a huge thing in canada you know if it's if it says five dollars on the shelf you're probably paying 750 you know (laughs) And um, yeah, the stores I was in was like five dollars per gram. Boom, very affordable. Even you know, homeless people that had begged for a few hours can afford to come in and buy a gram, and that will last them the day or whatever you know. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, and like to your question, then we had our own tills every night. We would just we had to write down or record our sales and basically add up the cash, put it in an envelope, dump it all into a safe. And then the owner just comes along two or three times a week, empties the safe and off he goes. And I know that a lot of them were not filing their taxes, you know? And in in the end, that's probably why they got shut down. Mm -hmm. Like I was saying, you know, because obviously the government's not getting their fair share and they say, well, Fair enough. If you don't want to play ball, we'll just shut you down, put you out of business. Do you feel like if the government would have kept looking the other way, if they would have paid their taxes? Possibly. Yeah, possibly. From the hundreds of customers I've served in my three years in the industry, everybody has an opinion on the industry, you know, and I would say 80% of Canadians would prefer to go back to the the illegal model when the black market was you know front of stage mm-hmm. they they all preferred the cannabis industry when it was illegal they said legalizing marijuana was the worst thing in canada you know and i'm like why it just makes no sense to even say that but yeah. 
you know, when you're when you're living it and experience it every day, it it totally makes sense because they're just making it more difficult, you know. One of the main things I found when I was reading up was that making it legal made the ramifications for the users a lot less life-changing. There's a story that Trudeau used when he was for legalizing pot about the person who they committed the crime, they got convicted, and and their life fell apart from there. Do you believe that that is the case, that with it being legal, that there's less users being convicted of crimes because of it? Um. I would say drug dealers, you know, honestly, I think you legalize cannabis and the small time drug dealers are put out of business. So I think in Colorado, you said it was the third state to legalize it. Like, and the profit that they turned in, I think it was 2019, maybe was like something like $8 billion. That's billion with a B. So profit goes up, crime rate goes down. Like, that's the first thing I think every state experiences when they, when they do legalize it. it. Like, economically, it has huge benefits, and the crime rate does tend to go down. I suppose it's just a small time. Dealers do go out of business. And uh, so when you left, and it wasn't that long ago, it's, it's legal. It's probably legal to stay, right? Yes, I think it would be legal forever now. I think it would just cause riots if they went back on their promise to potheads all across Canada, you know, and it's more than less been legal forever anyway. Since it is the whole country, and that's something that's quite amazing, too. Mm. Do you think it would be better for the government to just take the taxes and get out of the business and leave it to the shops that were already there? Um, I think they should be giving out the licenses a lot more frequently you know I have worked for some really really good businessmen who were they own multiple businesses and they tried their luck in the cannabis industry and they did everything the right way and they were still denied their license and I thought you know that's pretty harsh because the customers were coming in they could afford the the cannabis rather than the legal stuff they they liked the service that we were providing. Um, it was close to their home. You know, a lot of elderly people who can't make it out that far or have to use a walker, you know. They um they need a store in the yeah. in the neighborhood. They don't have to get the bus every day in rainy Vancouver, you know. Yeah. Um it's just stuff like that, you know. They should put up more dispensaries. I think, and all kind of come together and say, okay, we're going to make it more affordable. The government can have their share and, you know, more and more people can open up dispensaries, create jobs, provide different services to their local community. Like we actually provided in an effort, it was like a stipulation in getting our business license. We provided therapy and yoga different classes in the back of our store (laughs) like can you imagine that no it's just it's so (laughs) random I know but we did we had um and it was free for the community as well because it was kind of a rough not a rough area but like a low employment area if that makes sense yeah yeah and uh, a poor area I'm trying to say sure and people would show up and they a lot of homeless people would and we had a we had a therapist on site that would nice. work with them and try and get them, yeah. you know, keep their head above water, try and find them a shelter, try and find them possible employment. Yeah. And it was just kind of someone for them to talk to and yeah. hang out. And they would always get a free pre-roll joint when they came in. <laughs> and then we had uh, people coming in doing yoga, too. Yeah. And, you know, at the end of it all, we're saying we're providing these services for different people in the community and hopefully it'll help us get our license. But more often than not, it was just it didn't matter. We still got shut down. So you can be a part of the community. You can want to do some social good, but that still doesn't always help for the criteria of getting a license from the government. And Mm, so with the 
with the legal marijuana and with the illegal marijuana, uh, I don't know which one you want to speak to, but where is it grown? Does the government care where it's grown? Um, I I believe they do. Yeah, it has to be obviously good quality and you know yielded correctly. Um, I think out in like places like Chilliwack and stuff, they've got like warehouses. You you're familiar with Chilliwack? Yeah. Just kind of places like that on the outskirts of uh of Vancouver, you know, okay. they have lots of grow operations around there. And um you could get a pretty good job there in the summer actually cultivating plants. <laughs> Something yeah. I looked into at a time, yeah. but uh yeah. it was just too far outside the city for me. Mm-hmm. That but uh, yeah, it's is. grown and they they grow a lot on Vancouver Island as well. So in your mind, what could really benefit both the government in getting their peas and the people is fixing how a, a business who's not mm-hmm. a government shop, letting them get their legal license, right? Yeah, is that kind exactly. of what you're saying? Yeah, I think they should make the license more attainable to businesses you know even when they follow all of their stipulations you can go through all these bullet points of things you need to do in order to obtain your license and even when you meet the criteria you might be denied and we're kind of we're we're left puzzled thinking what do we have to do we do everything you say we jump through every hoop that you throw at us and we still get denied i think they should do things properly like make it make it like maybe a college course or some kind of like they shouldn't just hire anybody and yeah just do do things the right way and I feel like I worked in seven or eight different dispensaries as I said and there was good and bad about every store I worked in I would say and hopefully one day I can open up my own store and Mm -hmm. you know just take everything that I liked about each of these stores and adapt it to my own strategy if that makes sense oh yeah because where else do you see the ideas and get of what works and what doesn't work than through experience i think that you can learn things from a book certainly you can but you can also mm-hmm. learn things from that firsthand experience and seeing that i think that's important so is there any save that once we get past covid or if covid hadn't happened do you see that there is the will amongst businessmen or political leaders to work together to make something like that happen to make it more definitive that Joe's shop down the road can get a license and there's enough for everyone there's a the government will probably so. make more money yeah. letting Joe yeah. have his shop I think so but I don't think it'll happen overnight I think during COVID is a perfect time for them to kind of you know, the government deal with the COVID stuff, but have a separate department where they say, okay, we're going to iron out all of these issues in the cannabis industry and, you know, do it the right way and work collaboratively with all of the illegal pot shops around, not just BC, but, you know, out in Ontario and everywhere across Canada, Montreal, wherever. And I think they could do things the right way. Everybody could have a piece of the pie, but the government is just being kind of greedy. Do you think they didn't know what they didn't know? And rather than just collecting, collecting the, ta- I'm not, I have nothing against the government collecting their taxes from the product. Oh, me all. neither. They and, have to, but I mean, yeah. it's just too much almost. Obviously you want to make the economy better. Like, of course, every state wants to capitalize on legal marijuana, but you have to make it affordable to people as well, people of all demographics. And so I think to me, what it sounds like is they they bit off more than they could chew. And uh, and it's kind of it doesn't seem like it would be working as well as it could. Yeah, exactly. I think. um, Well, I I thought that people were going to boycott the legal stores because it was so expensive, but you've also got a huge population of people in Canada that are very wealthy and can afford to pay these these large prices, you know? So they will keep coming back and keep them keep the market going, you know, if that makes sense. Yeah. And there's the the illegal stores too, where you know, people 
that don't make a whole lot of money, they yeah. they kind of tend to go to these stores then. Yeah. Do you think that the people who go to the government stores and pay the exorbitant prices, not only are they probably able to afford it, do you think they're afraid of possibly getting in trouble going to the the stores that have been there for years and the government's kind of ignored until probably now? I I've experienced that, yeah. I've I've experienced that. I've had customers come in and you know, they come up to me at the counter and they're like looking over their shoulder and they're like, yo, am I good to be in here? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's totally fine. Like, Even the cops, the cops themselves come in there sometimes and lawyers and stuff. And it's it just like it, in no other country would this happen? You know, certainly not in Ireland. You know, no, certainly like, it would in if, the United States. Give us a chance. Yeah. <laughs> but if I went to like the main street in Ireland right now and decided, okay, I don't have a permit, I don't have a business license, I'm just going to rent out this building and start selling whatever I want, you'd be shut down within the first hour. You know, mm-hmm. but in mm-hmm. Vancouver, these stores exist for months or even years. And they do eventually get shut down, but a lot of them just, they don't. And the cops come in there and take a look around and no problem. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That's interesting. And I've never, I've never gotten that answer the whole time I was there. People are just, they, Canadian people just kind of shrug their shoulders and say, oh, well, <laughs> it is what Can- it is. Canadians are so nice. They are. So the, laid back. Yes. They're so laid back. Canadians are very nice people yeah yeah they're most accommodating yeah friendly people you'll ever oh, meet so do you want to go back i do i do i'm thinking maybe next year hopefully i'll go back there and hopefully things will be a little bit different in the cannabis industry yeah. i actually my my hope is to one day open my own store yeah whether it's here when they eventually legalize it in ireland which i don't think they're in any rush to do that um but i could do that possibly in canada you know i have the expertise um if i had enough money or if i had a premises or Mm -hmm. you know a good enough partner then Mm -hmm. i could definitely do it and i could do it the right way you know because i've seen i've seen it fail more than more than once more than twice i've seen shops shut down and whatnot and i i think i know how to run a cannabis store the right way would you ever want to work towards maybe citizenship in Canada where you could work politically to make those kind of changes? Yes, definitely. That's something I'm in the process of doing right now. I actually had a visa that expired and I came home uh-huh. in January because they told me, you know, you don't want to get in any trouble. So go mm-hmm. home, work for minimum a year and you know build up some good credit and come back to us then and we'll talk so that's basically what i'm doing right now and hopefully next year i'll be back out there you'll go back to vancouver yes i believe so yeah i have a lovely partner in vancouver still so we're doing the long distance thing right now she's worked in the cannabis industry a long long time as well so we're hoping to team up and open up our own store uh-huh. that's yeah, kind sure. of what we've always talked about you know so yeah, and she can, it could happen it could is she canadian yeah she is australian but oh, okay. grew, grew up in bc she yeah. moved to bc when she was like seven years old so she's okay. pretty much yeah. full canadian yeah good for mm-hmm. you that would be yeah that would be awesome yeah yeah i can just picture myself me me and her just working in our weed shop selling weed in the sunshine that's growing just like, old together yeah yeah yeah. that's just the the dream in my mind yeah yeah and it's a beautiful <laughs> place to live vancouver is just it is a really awesome place and it is uh, yeah and, and i could see you wanting to get involved in the political side of it because that's kind of the only way to really move things forward to help make the changes it seems like there's that one little bit Mm. of getting the government out of the selling and just letting them tax is that kind of is that a kind of what you believe yeah absolutely and i i do think it will improve over the next few years like hopefully by the time i get there but i think anybody opening up their own dispensary 
it's definitely worth investing some time to study the legislation surrounding the cannabis laws and the industry in general, you know, because you want to cover yourself in that aspect. And um, yeah, just make sure you're doing the right thing and not taking any shortcuts. Yeah. Because if you take shortcuts, you get cut short, as they say. <laughs> For sure. Um, but ultimately, I do see it like, you know, Colorado legalized, New York, as you mentioned yeah. earlier. I mean, pretty much everything that happens over in the western side of the world follows over to the uk and when the uk does something ireland copies the uk and then the rest of europe and i think at this point in time it has to become legalized at some point within the next 10 years although i remember saying that about 10 years ago now (laughs) and (laughs) still nothing but i i think they they do have to you know there's really no excuse to not get with the times almost you know yeah um and it's not to say like legalize weed so we can all become stoners and have fun you know it's like do things the right way so i just think it needs to be respected and not abused it should be legal and sold in the same way alcohol is not even in the same way like not like at bar but they should they should sell it in like pharmacies Mm -hmm. They should sell it, open up their own medical cannabis dispensaries and maybe make it 21 years. You have to get a license to buy it. Um, It puts the drug dealers out of business. The economy and profits skyrocket. Mm -hmm. I just mean like people do need to realize that too much weed will definitely affect your mental, you know? Yeah. So, uh but same, same as alcohol, same as everything else, you know? And to be clear, for those who are listening, we are talking about smoking weed. We are not talking about edibles. We are not talking about gummies. We are not talking about any other of those ways of consuming it where you may mm-hmm. get a more powerful uh, effect from it. This is Absolutely. just Absolutely. That's just smoking. something people definitely need to realize as well is, there is a huge difference between eating cannabis and smoking it. Like you will feel the effects a lot differently. Um, the edibles are a lot of fun though, you know. Um, some people I know just have edibles for sleep. Uh-huh. They, um, you can have like 10 milligrams or whatever. Uh-huh. You can buy like, it looks like a Lego piece and you can cut off one piece of Lego and it's just yeah. a gummy that you eat. Yeah. And, You'll have the best sleep of your life, honestly. Yeah. When I was recovering, I had a car accident and I was oh, wow. beyond my spine surgeries. I had had spine surgeries and I just couldn't take any more of the pills. I just, I could not do that. And of course, pot's legal here in, uh, in Colorado where I live. And I went and got myself some watermelon gummies and I did try that because nothing else was helping with. And there's nothing worse than nerve pain. There's just nothing worse than nerve pain. You probably build up a dependency to those painkillers over time. And I mean, they just make you you sick. Yeah, they do. I've heard that. I've heard that. So I tried the gummies. And the gummies are the best. It really helped. That with the CBD, you know, the non uh, get you high stuff, that mixed within my diet, it helped. It helped immensely. It absolutely helps. Yeah. 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 As long as you, you need to find what works for you because yeah. what works for you might not work for the next person. I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but a lot of my customers were patients like cancer patients, unfortunately. And that was one of the sad parts of working in the industry. They would come in and they would tell me about the severe pain that they're in yeah. daily. And they're like, yeah i'm so grateful that you guys are just around the corner from my house you know and i'm like wow i really hope we don't shut down because what's this person going to do they're going to have to get their weed delivered or they're going to have to travel far and wide to get it and yeah it's just and another good thing about for chemotherapy patients is and my sister explained this to me and once she did i was like oh uh is it makes them be able to eat yes appetite sleep yeah it aids all of these little yeah. aspects yeah because it gives you the munchies you know yeah and and i never thought about that because you need to eat when you're on chemotherapy and i had no idea that to put the two together because it's just not mm-hmm. what i 
it's just, it wasn't in my wheelhouse. I just, I don't know what I don't know. And, and that's why I, I like having conversations like this. Me I'm too, able absolutely. to learn something. And, uh, yeah. and so do you think you'll see in your lifetime, definitely the changes in Canada get better, but do you think you'll see the changes in your homeland in Ireland? I think both. Yeah, I do. I really think that like Canada's not that far off it within the next few years. Like it shouldn't take that long at all, but they should have had a plan in place when they legalized it in 2018. Um, but I think they'll, like I say, hash out their, <laughs> pardon the pun, hash out their, their issues, you know? Yeah. And um, I think in Ireland, they might introduce something, but they'll roll it out very slowly. Yeah, you know, I, there's actually a huge cannabis activist community in in Ireland. Um, they really do want it here, and I just think just give it to them. It's it's not. I'm not going to say it's harmless because it is. They can cause a lot of harm to people uh, if abused. But like I say, that's with everything. Yes. And if you're if you're going to celebrate alcohol, then why not? cannabis absolutely well you know it's been it's been so much fun talking with you today and i know you have a podcast the high cost of living tell me about that yeah so like the way it came about actually was when i first started in the cannabis industry one of the ogs that i talked about earlier he's like i don't want to say an elderly guy but he was much older than i was and he had worked and experienced the industry for years before I was even born probably and he told me that you know welcome to the industry this is my first day he said the beautiful thing about this industry is you're going to meet people from all demographics you know because cannabis is universal it's for everybody um well as long as you're of the legal age of course <laughs> you're going to meet young people old people male female rich homeless lawyers drug dealers gangsters doctors you name it everybody will come through this store no one day will be the same you know and i i love that you know and then it, he was he was damn right in what he was saying definitely you know and so i finished up in the cannabis industry because of covid i was just like i said a little bit sketchy at the time I didn't want to be anywhere but indoors when the government was saying stay at home. I stayed at home for a long time, especially in the first lockdown. And I thought, you know what? I really want to start a podcast. I've always wanted to, but I thought so many people are doing these little projects during COVID now. Like, why don't I start? But it's now is the time for this. You know what I mean? And I'm sure COVID gave birth to so many different podcasts out there. Yeah. And I thought, what would I really like? And that's, that's an aspect about the cannabis industry that I liked, that I could be talking to you today. I could be talking to a 20-year-old skater tomorrow. I could be talking to a cancer patient the next day. I could be talking to a lawyer. I could be talking to a homeless person. I'm just meeting all different kinds of people from all over the world because, like, Vancouver is so multicultural. Yeah. And now I've like internet access to mm -hmm. potential guests from all over the world. We can do this over Zoom. Um, you know, I can just even approach people on the street and say, hey, would you be interested in sharing your story? Like, I love your your concept behind your podcast because it kind of aligns with my own. Yeah. You know, people of the world, we the mm -hmm. citizens. Yeah. Uh, I just want to interview any and everybody. You know, it, you don't have to be a celebrity you don't have to have a super unique story because i feel like every human being has a story to tell yeah. and by the end of it all when i'm old and gray <laughs> i mean while. like yeah yeah <laughs> larry king just passed away recently you know larry king is yeah. an iconic interviewer mm -hmm. he had been doing it his whole life mm -hmm. and i'm like you know if i interviewed one person a week every week for the next 50 years imagine the catalog of stories that i'll have by the end of it yeah. and i'm just going to call it the high cost of living because the title is so open 
if that makes sense oh, like yeah. it's so so open to interpretation uh-huh. like the high part can talk about cannabis living is just about life in general so it's a broad range of topics that i'll be covering and when there is no guests because during covid for a while there i had no access to guests i couldn't leave the house and i was still figuring out this internet networking stuff so uh, i just said you know what i'm just gonna go freehand and do some solo episodes so yeah i'm six months in right now there's 20 episodes live on my channel there's about seven solo episodes and maybe 13 interviews about all different kinds of topics and uh i'm coming back i'm taking a short hiatus right now trying to guest on as many podcasts as i can like today and um having guests on too i, I might get you on my podcast if you're open to that awesome love it <laughs> and just basically i'm trying to build up a backlog of interviews right now so that when june comes summertime yeah. i'll have a lot of interviews stashed in the vault it totally is a good thing and i looked through your guests you have a variety of guests and i really get at the high cost of living but it can be an innuendo for being high but it doesn't necessarily mean that because there is a high cost of living and mm-hmm. we all experience it and i i like a lot of your interviews because there are there's so many different kinds of people and mm-hmm. my premise of my podcast is i want to talk to people want to talk about things that we don't normally talk about nobody talks about pot well hardly anybody not a lot of people do not a lot of people talk you know about their experiences working in shops or even living abroad and we all I, i think we need to talk about a lot of things because we're stuck on this planet together whether we like it or not (laughs) that's right that's right and you know i am really just inspired by passionate people it doesn't have to be like we don't have to be passionate about the same thing but if you're passionate about something i'm passionate about something i would love to compare and contrast and talk about things you know I i think especially in a world where like you know i even think about my friends now and like anytime i meet up with my friends we're if we're not going out to a bar drinking listening to loud music we're playing the playstation or we're playing poker or we're playing cards or you know we always have to have a distraction if that makes sense yeah anytime i'm with a friend there's there has to be some distraction but i'm like why can't we just have a round table talk me and my friends you know i want to know what's going on in his life i want to know what she's waking up for every morning what's keeping her motivated what she working towards you know i want to tap into people's minds if that makes sense i don't want to meet up with you and you know play playstation or something that's never been my gig you know so yeah that's kind of why i started people to have those conversations though it is i feel like yeah people people don't want to have a conversation they don't want to talk about themselves you know they don't want to open up they just they're happy to go out and socialize but there has to be an external distraction do you have a theory you know you know about why um i don't really to be honest maybe a cultural thing it's yeah it's just the way we're brought up yeah but one more reason i would say is i remember the power went out in my hometown but a few years ago now and uh, i remember this particular night we had no tv we had no playstation we had no light so we couldn't even play cards because the light was dim too low. We just lit a candle and there was three of us sitting around in a room. And I swear to God that night, I, I started talking to a guy that it was just three of us. It was my cousin and my cousin's cousin, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, he had a few incredible stories, you know, and he started talking and we ended up just chatting from like 11 PM until like 4 AM. And I was like, oh, my God, like five hours just went past. And I was like, I, I enjoyed listening to this guy's stories. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. And I'm like, I wish the power would go out every night so we could just actually enjoy the art of conversation yeah. instead of this watch a movie together and not talk, you know, yeah. instead of, you know, yeah. 
playing poker and just focusing on the game, if that makes sense. No, yeah. there's not, nothing against PlayStation. And so I still enjoy all of that. Yeah. It's not like every night I just want to go around and mm-hmm. talk to people like that, you know, but I think it should be, it should happen more. Yeah. It should yeah. build that connection, you know? Yeah. So what's, what's one thing maybe I didn't ask you that, uh, that I didn't, that you'd huh. like to tell us? Well, I'm a big Man- Manchester United fan. Yeah, it's it's pretty sad. I know I've been yapping on about how great weed is, but I made a New Year's resolution to not smoke weed, and I haven't now in three months. How do you feel different? To be honest, I don't. Okay. I really don't. You miss- uh, Everybody says, you know, when you quit weed, you're going to feel so different and more energy and clear mind and all that, but I honestly feel the exact same. Yeah. It's not like it's not like I'm against weed because yeah. obviously, obviously you've heard that I'm so for yeah. it. The reason is is because I talked about how illegal it is in Ireland. Mm-hmm. And I'm coming back to Ireland and I yeah. said, you know what? I was smoking the best weed in the world in Vancouver. Yeah. BC Bud is yeah. world renowned, you know, and it's affordable. And now I'm coming back here to Ireland and I'm going to have to purchase some mediocre weed Mm -hmm. for like way over the price that it should be. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not even going to do that. It's for the first time in my life for probably years, I've taken a, a break from smoking weed and it's something to do with my asthma as well, you know? Like I mentioned earlier, it's yeah. not like, like, I wish I could, but it needs to be respected, you know, yeah. marijuana. Sure. You don't want to be high all the time, all your life. You need to, yeah. you need to go through a period of sobriety to find yourself. Mm-hmm. Don't want to be reliant on any substance, yes. you know, yeah. whether it's pills, pot, booze, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and I said, okay, I'm moving home. This is your chance. It's covid we yeah. had a strict, strict lockdown in Ireland. So yeah. we actually couldn't drive two kilometers outside of our house oh. unless you had a, an essential reason. Yeah. Yeah. So even if I wanted to smoke weed, it, I couldn't really, you know. I mean, I could risk it, but I could get in a lot of trouble. And yeah. if, I got, if I got caught with weed here in Ireland, I might never get back out to Canada. Mm-hmm. so I say, what are the consequences in ireland oh like i think they're actually getting stricter on it to be honest i mean if you get caught with one or two grams you might get a fine it'll be a hefty fine something like 500 euro yeah that's a lot. and and it's kind of like your first warning if that makes sense that's but if so you get odd. caught again or if you get caught with more amounts then you're in more trouble basically and i think you might get three strikes and third strike and you're out <laughs> is it jail time prison time uh if you were caught with a, a substantial amount yes you could definitely get that or if it's seen as you know enough for you to be distributing mm-hmm. they see you as a dealer then they lock you up for sure but honestly I just couldn't risk it anymore. Yeah. I almost had an asthma attack like <laughs> oh, a yeah. few months. This was actually before COVID. I almost had an asthma attack and it felt really bad. And I thought, man, I just need to quit smoking weed. <laughs> like maybe I would love just to have edibles, you know, mm-hmm. never smoke and just have edibles. Yeah. I would, I would happily live the rest of my life with just a jelly uh-huh. every day. <laughs> yeah but that's that's something that you you've gone without was there any kind of withdrawal yes absolutely there was and still is to be honest like um sleep is probably the biggest one yeah. you have extremely vivid dreams and i don't know what causes it but you kind of have very vivid dreams that are like almost a movie sometimes they're nightmares you oh, know it can be yeah. terrifying yeah uh the sweats at night cold yeah. sweats you're yeah. kind of tossing and turning in bed and yeah your appetite gets a bit weird and um 
Honestly, I notice things like I feel like I have this nervous pit in my stomach all the time. Yeah. And um, it's maybe yeah. some anxiety coming up. Yeah. But um, I don't really have a super duper craving for, it, you know, I think I'm actually coping quite well. Like my friends in Ireland do still smoke weed. And I met, met up with them recently and they were smoking a joint right next to me. And they're like, here, you want some passing me the joint? And I was like, no, nah, I'm good. Because I feel like at three months, I don't want to ruin the pattern, you know. And like I say, like, I am all for it. I am. I fully believe in it. I just want, I don't want the listeners thinking that I'm contradicting myself now because no. they're like, oh, well, if you're so for it, why'd you quit? I mean, everybody needs a break, you know. And I like to drink this once is, in a while and yeah, I yeah. all the time. Yeah. Yeah, you're not against drink. You just don't drink every day. I think it should be fully legalized in every part of the world. I feel like everybody should experiment with it, educate themselves on the subject and I just decided, okay, 27 now, let's see, let's see what it's like without it. You know, I don't want to be reliant on it. I like it. I support it. I'm all for it, but I don't want to be reliant on something for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. I feel good. I don't feel a whole lot different, but I do feel good. You know, I think it takes time. Yeah. yeah. Get back to the high cost of living. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to the <laughs> podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. The We as Citizens podcast, because conversation matters.